Well, hey, everybody, thank you for your patience. Um, we are going to go ahead and take the full 80 minutes, though, because that's just kind of the revolutionaries we are. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to ask you all, if you could do is go ahead and mute yourselves um, so that we can keep kind of the extraneous sounds uh, contained there. So I But don't mute me because I'm talking. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. So my name is Andrea Merida, and um, you're going to be hearing from myself, from um, our Green Party presidential nominee, Howie Hawkins, as well as uh, Chris Blankenhorn, who is our media and tech director from the campaign, as well as from Virginia Rodino, who is our press secretary. Um, and we want to talk to you a little bit today about that organism that really is the basis of the Green Party and all of our organizing, and that is the local. Um, you know, we do have among our 10 key values the, the principle of uh, uh, grassroots democracy. We do see organizing and building the party from a bottom up solution, right? And so those of you who, who are involved in organizing and trying to keep the lights on in your green local, um, you really are responsible for maintaining the backbone of the Green Party. It's you're the one that's in the hot seat. That's all. That's a privilege, but it's also um, a big responsibility. And so, you know, as we were navigating through the campaign um, and, and, you know, really for over two years, we saw lots of commonalities in uh, many places uh, throughout the country and throughout the state parties and, and what have you. And we often see that there are a, a small handful of people in every local um, who are keeping the lights on. They're doing everything in their power to try to maintain, in some cases, ballot status, you know, trying to maintain their social media presence, just trying to do the things to at least let people know that the Green Party exists, right? Um, and that is very noble. And I, I, we take our hats off to those people who are really keeping the lights on, because um, we wouldn't we wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for those people. But now we're at a point where we really have to go to the next level, and that means increasing our our membership, increasing the number of basically hands that we have on deck to complete the organizing work that we really need to do. Um, so um, I'm going to talk for probably another 10 minutes and then I'm going to punt over to Howie um, and then we're going to go to Chris and then we're going to go to Virginia and then we think we have another 15 or 20 minutes for questions and answers. So we'll ask you to save all of your questions uh, for the end of the presentation um, with our thanks. So um, one of the things that was um, very apparent as we were dealing with state parties and local parties throughout the country was that, you know, A, as I said, we have very a few amount of hands on deck to complete the work that needed to get done. Um, but we also saw that um, a lot of times folks didn't have really solid connections in the community. You know, you, they really couldn't tell you who was working on what initiative and, and you know, these other things like this. And, you know, of course, the overriding uh, theme of, of this a and is anti-oppression. We think that when you handle some of the basic brass tacks of trying to build movement and based on an anti-capitalist analysis and based on an analysis of solidarity and an impetus of solidarity with people in your community, we think that's kind of the calculus we need to be able to build those local those local parties again that are the backbone, um, and so what do I mean by solidarity? Um, and, and kind of a generic definition of solidarity is a unity or agreement of feeling or action, especially among individuals with a common interest, a mutual support within a group. And so, what do I mean by an anti-capitalist analysis, and what does that have to do with with what I'm talking about? So looking at and having critiques about capitalism shows us that the common source of all of the oppressions that we're facing, including the climate crisis, has one source, at least in this country, right? And that is capitalism. And that's a system that's built on exploitation of human beings, animals, and natural resources. 
and it depends and it's successful when we're working against and we're pitted against each other. And so when we have an orientation of solidarity, that is one of the core tenets of an anti-capitalist framework, then we can very easily see that we have a common oppressor that we all need to work together to defeat in order to achieve justice for human beings, for the environment, for the climate, for all of these aspects, right? Now, not every green needs to be a, a, a firm socialist. I mean, I certainly am. But if you can at least understand that capitalism works for the few and not for the many, it's easier to build solidarity with folks in your community and it's easier to outreach as well. Um, you know, we have to have an ongoing internal political education on topics of these anti-capitalist ideas and also you know, things related to decolonization um, from the systems of oppression as we do this work. You're gonna hear a lot of uh, conversations during this A&M about privilege. Um, and what tends to happen, um, you know, some of the concepts of privilege are have been around for at least a decade. We've been having in, as a Green Party these conversations for a long time. And I think, you know, movements like Black Lives Matter, I, the, the calls for uh, defunding the police, you know, all of the solidarity around uh, Standing Rock and some of the other pipeline struggles and things have taught us that there is a way of looking at people in a way that requires their silence so that the capitalism can have compliance, right? So this question of privilege comes up a lot. And I have to say that um, what we are, we're kind of in a standstill as a party where we're very focused on the issues of solidarity, or excuse me, of privilege. And we've kind of gotten ourselves a little afraid to operate within our communities and even within our own local parties. When we change the orient orientation of solidarity, in other words, let's work together because we have a common enemy, then we're less inclined to be frozen in place, afraid to say the wrong things to people, afraid to use the wrong pronouns, those kinds of things. So we do need to have an ongoing political uh, education internally in our local so that we constantly deal with those things, right? Um, because then we can become less afraid to actually orient ourselves in a way of solidarity. You know, so we have to basically, when we're outreaching to the community, when we're building those connections in the community, we have to fake it until we make it. You know, um, and, and when you operate from a solidarity framework, then it's easier for you to show up to these community initiatives and you're not gonna immediately start recruiting, but you're actually gonna go there to listen and learn. I personally, and I think that is true for my other comrades that are gonna be talking today, I personally believe that human beings are good. I think that most of us have a good handle on our empathy, right? And so when you go and listen and learn and meet people and let them talk to you and introduce themselves to you and those kinds of things, our natural inclination, our human inclination towards solidarity, towards empathy is naturally gonna rise to the fore. So I, I wouldn't worry about that too much, you know, if if you if the game plan that you all set in your uh in your local is to is is to listen and learn and operate in in a lens of solidarity then things are going to fall into place with you assuming that you're also doing your political education um now a lot of the building that we have to do um is dependent upon having a strategy and it's dependent about, uh, about decisions about how we make decisions in our locals. And so grassroots democracy is a thing that we have to observe in our locals, right? Um, we have to do some constant work of at looking at our bylaws. You know, do they contain ar arcane kind of outdated methods that don't really suit the people that we have in the room and at the table at that moment? Um, you know, we, as a as a as a party, we tend to tack toward a consensus process, and I'll, I'll suggest to you. Um, a, so many of you have read this already, and that's the uh, tyranny of structurelessness, by written by Joe Freeman, and it's a, it's a it's a short document that was essay that was written kind of in response to what was going on in the in the feminism movement uh, for a while, and 
you know, long story short, what it says is that when you kind of have a system that's an old boy network, and sometimes it's an old girl network, and sometimes it's an old person network, um, and that and you're not really paying attention to making sure that within de a democratic a democratic framework that not everybody gets to be heard, then you start to create a lot of strife, right? So within our, our consensus process, it can be very good as long as you're making the stop around the room and making sure that everybody has something to say. Part of the problem with the consensus process and why I personally advocate for kind of an up and down vote for everything, and that's the way we do our local uh, decision making here in Denver, is that as long as you seem to go along with what everybody else is going with, you know, the consensus process actually provides a way for you to hide behind everyone else. And then you become dissatisfied because you actually haven't been heard. And so I actually advocate for a, a lot more, um, you know, um, present kind of uh, democratic process. Take that up and down vote, right? Um, one of the dynamics that we've seen in recent times in the Green Party, and if you're in, interested or, or working in local um, you know, um, anti-racism or anti, uh, you know, a police accountability type movements. The dynamic that we've seen a lot of time is this concept of centering oppressed voices. And, and you know, just a quick word about that. Um, we, I understand the impetus behind wanting to center voices, but we need to be able to understand that what what we should be doing is actually listening to people dealing with the internal conflicts um, that 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 might trigger, right? But not everybody necessarily is suited to leadership. And if your organization is running democratically, you avoid the problem of having the one person with some sort of an oppressed identity kind of, you know, putting kinks in the work and taking your attention away from the, the, the game plan that you all have decided to, to use, right? So a lot of times when people quote unquote center oppressed voices, what they're actually doing is allowing this person to become author, uh, authoritarian, right? Whether or not that person accepts what the green platform is, whether or not that person um, is intersectional in their own analysis. In other words, they see the, the linking oppression between all, uh, all these different uh, identities that are oppressed under the system. And, and so what happens is we tend to wanna to throw democracy out the window because we we feel guilty because we're white, we feel guilty because we're straight, we feel guilty because we may be a little bit affluent and we throw democracy out the window to deal with that guilt. And that's not the way we should be doing things. You have to have a democratic method of making decisions. You have to be very intentional about it and you have to make sure that your documents, your government governing documents reflect that, right? Um, and that's going to come up with for, that's going to cause some very difficult conversations in your organization. And so I advocate as well for making sure that you have kind of a code of conflict that you all discuss and that you ratify democratically. Um, you need to define, first of all, who your members actually are, who can actually vote on something like that. Right. And I really advocate for a conflict resolution, a resolution process or a grievance process. I will recommend to you that the Green Party of Utah uh, spent a lot of time in building um, this uh, grievance and conflict resolution policy. So take some time to go over to the, uh, the GPUT website and look at that policy and see if that's something that you can institute. Because the reality of the situation is, is that if we're doing our outreach correctly and if we're bringing uh, more diverse voices into our local, um, the likelihood that we're going to inadvertently stumble on someone's toes is actually going to, you, know, you can count on it. And so that's a necessary conversation that needs to be had. But how do you seek resolution to uh, from uh, for that? How do you get people back onto track? And I think these two documents that you ratify democratically um, really have to be part of what the local does before they go out and start um, outreaching externally. You know, another quick word about democracy is um, we have to be honest about the fact that in many places in our Green Party around the country, 
democracy does not have the same definition for everyone, right? What that what I mean, what do I mean by that? Oftentimes we have people that will participate in a consensus process or will uh, participate in an up or down vote and they're angry about the outcome because they got overruled, right? And then they create they start hijacking systems and I mean this happened to us in Colorado some years back. You know, um and so your code of conduct policy needs to have some uh, uh, sanctions and escalating sanctions, but they also have to be met with, um, uh, 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 you know, coaching for that person and some educational resources for that person and recalibration. Because one of the things that we've seen as well across the country is that when there's internal disputes, a lot of times somebody does some hijacking. So how can you pay attention to the business of organizing and business of outreach if you're dealing with this internal conflict. If you decide on these rules, these uh, you know standards of conduct democratically before you really start looking outward, that is really gonna solve a lot of problems. Now I just have a, a couple of minutes left and I just wanna talk about strategy on what your outreach strategy is, right? Um, you know, we have to take time to figure out who is doing what in our community? What are the big issues? Who are the groups that are organizing around these issues? Um, you know, what is the e the leadership in this group, formal or informal? You know, um, a lot of times we want to go after the issue that the nonprofit organization is in charge of. Okay, you know, there's like Sunrise Movement and things like that. Those those seem like logical groups for us to go after, but we also have to be honest about the fact that the 501c3 structure means that they can't really work with a political party. So what are the other options that you have? And so you have to be connected into the community. I mean, use Facebook to find out what people are organizing around. Check out where the protests are happening. You know, what are the leftists in your community doing? What is DSA in your community if you have one? What are they doing? And you know, go to those events, see who's there, but try to do everything you can to figure out what are the big problems in your community and who's doing the work around that. You know, Howie's probably going to talk a little bit about the Australian Greens and their deep canvassing model. Um, and and what, the, what the Australian Greens actually did is that they, they drew up a profile of who they thought uh, was most affected by the deepest problems in that community. I mean, they knew how old that person was. They knew roughly how much that person made. They knew whether or not that person was a renter or not a renter. And they did that by actually having conversations with people. Howie's going to talk more about that. Um, so, you know, kind of to bring it full circle a little bit. And, you know, we did say that this, the, you, you have to have a plan for your strategy. You have to map out what you think more or less your uh, tactics and your focuses are gonna be for a period of time, let's say a year, say five years. And you have to attach goals to that. In a year's time, we will recruit five more dues paying members. Um, and you know, that's I'm gonna put the dues uh, uh, in it as a little note in the back of your mind because we, we have to be able to pay for the things that we do, right? Um, so your, your strategy needs to be how you're going to deal with the problems of the day, how you're going to, uh, you know, grow your organization with members who are willing to contribute. What is your political uh, education ongoing uh, going to look like? Um, and what kind of events are you actually going to hold in order to put the word out there that the Greens are doing something, right? So I don't want to go on too much further because I don't want to, uh, what, what my other comrades here have to say is very, very important. Um, the last thing that I will say is that, you know, I mentioned decolonization very, very um, quickly. One of the things that we need to decolonize ourselves from as Greens who are anti-capitalists is, 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 is these notions around productivity. The concept of productivity doesn't belong to us, right? If all you can do in a period of time, say a year, is to recruit one member because that's the capacity you have then that's the capacity that you have and that's enough. What you are doing is enough and you're not under anybody's time frame, right? You, you, you can only accomplish what is necessary. So don't get yourself bogged down in goals that you know you, if you're honest, you can't really, you know, meet. So um, with that, I want to punt it over to uh, 
our 2020 nominee for president, um, Howie Hawkins. Howie, you're muted. Yeah, that will help. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you, Andrea. I, I, I was saying, I wanna suggest we need to raise our expectations of what we're capable of in our communities. We need to think about being a mass party that is about taking power in our communities. Because what we're really about is social change not just being some gadflies protesting on the side and not really changing anything. So do we have in our local a strategic plan on how we're gonna take power? If you're in a city or a metropolitan area, you know, it's likely to mean the inner city and the inner ring suburbs, the working class areas, are most likely gonna be responsive to our platform, share our interests, the people we can build solidarity with and make up a majority. We're gonna have more trouble in the outer ring suburbs and the exurbs, but we need a power structure analysis of our communities. Who's on our side? Who are our opponents? I mean, this is the kind of thing that SNCC and the Freedom Schools did. They taught power structure analysis as well as numeracy, literacy, and uh, black history, because they were about taking power. So I think, you know, that's the kind of expectations we should have. And just a few thoughts about that is, uh, you know, if you're in a rural area, that's neglected by both the Democrats and the Republicans. All that's out there is Fox News, uh, clear channels with 24 seven right wing radio and uh, the evangelical, evangelical Christian stations. I mean, I found that out, confirmed it uh, when I was campaigning. I drive across rural areas. That's all that was on the radio. And that's all that people are getting. And they're, they're not getting their uh, economic issues addressed. They're getting scapegoating of immigrants and people of color and Muslims and, you know, Sharia laws coming and all this crazy stuff. I mean, it's really crazy now. They believe Trump won the election. COVID is a hoax. Climate is a hoax. And it's all perpetrated by uh, self-serving liberal elites. If you're in a rural area, how do you talk to those people? So, and uh, give them an alternative. I think one thing we need to think of when we're organizing is, as we develop a strategic plan, I like the idea of paths of least resistance. First of all, if you haven't gotten involved, what communities, what groups are most likely to come with us first? And that's your core and you build out from that. But I think a lot of locals say, we're a bunch of older people, how do we get the younger people? We're mostly white, how do we get the black community involved? And so forth. You know, we're based in the university, we're the kind of educated middle class, how do we reach working class folks? And what I wanna talk about is, you know, Andrea mentioned the Australian Greens doing deep canvassing. It's really an idea that comes from the United States. And, uh, if you go to Jacobin, there have been some articles about that that are worth reading. Uh, but we have groups like People's Action that was out in Georgia, going into Trump country, talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, you know, in these uh, elections that led to those two senators being elected. And deep canvassing, or what they call in the labor movement, relational organizing, is you go out and talk to people, but you don't preach at them. Say, here's the leaf that here the answers, join us. You listen and you hear what people's concerns are and build a relationship and trust. And this is not the, you know, drive-by canvassing that you do in elections to find out who's with you so you can pull them on election day. This is about getting to know people in communities and building a relationship and trust. Because most people vote with their guts. They don't have a balance sheet where they check off the issues, they vote for people they think are on their side. So how do we build those relationships? Mostly the people that aren't voting that are the people we need to vote if we're gonna be successful. 
or working class people who are not so apathetic as they are alienated. They don't trust either party. They know that in our election system, they're mostly uncompetitive one party districts. Why vote? We already know who's gonna win. We get that from the single member district winner take all plurality voting system. And if people don't know to call it that, they know that the, the same people are gonna get reelected who they never see in their neighborhood. So what this deep canvassing is, is a conversations you have, and then you gotta follow up. It just can't be one time. You've gotta get their name and contact info and be regularly in touch with them. If they have email, that's good. A lot of people don't, you gotta phone them. And don't be discouraged if they're not responsive right away. People, you know, they, they got their lives to live. Uh, they may be somebody finishing school or raising a child. But the fact that you've communicated with them and, and shown them the respect that you want them to know what you're doing, a lot of those people will come around when they have the opportunity. So I would urge everybody to, to find out what this uh, deep canvassing is all about. And as you get to know people and they get to know you, um, we've also got to be visible in the community. We just can't be showing up at elections. People will get involved in the Green Party. Their motivation is to learn and to take action. So when you bring people in, don't bring them into the business meetings where you're dealing with the administration of the local party. You know, that's not why people, most people get involved. Some people like to do that and they're valuable. Most people come because they want to learn about the issues, learn about how to understand the issues and then take action on them. So when people do get involved, you know, educational forums and activities and people that may meet us on the street when we canvass and then they see us on the street or in the public hearings or in the newspapers, are, we're being active, then they know we're for real. And that helps build the trust in their ability to have some faith in us. Um, <clears throat> now, I've done a lot of canvassing in this neighborhood in Syracuse, New York, over the years, running for local office. It's a mostly black community, I'm a white guy, but I ended up running for the district council because I've been active on the issues. I'd run some citywide races, and it was actually on the QT members of the Demo black members of the Democratic Committee said, you know, he said, you got to run because our representative on the city council is not being responsive. We never hear from him. And he basically answering to interests outside the neighborhood. So I ended up running. Got over 40% three times, 48% one time. Probably would have won that election, but the Working Families Party sent in dozens of people the last 10 days from all over the state because they are more concerned with keeping a green off the ballot and supporting their working families, Democrats against Republicans and other races, which is a whole nother story. But um, what I'm saying is because of this, and I did a lot of door knocking. I mean, to this day, people come to me, not the district counselor, when they got issues with the city, you know, constituent issues. In fact, some of them think I am the counselor, but most of them just know I'm, I will respond. So I'm sitting in a storefront People knock on the door. I just got a phone call a minute ago from somebody in the neighborhood wants to deal with something. So this kind of canvassing, from my personal experience, I know works. And you know, the political science literature is the most, most effective way to persuade people to your point of view is this deep canvassing or what they call in the labor movement relational organizing. When you're organizing a union, you got to take people as they are in the bargaining unit you're trying to organize. And they're gonna be all over the political spectrum. And you gotta know how to relate to that and help them find their commonalities. That's what organizers do. Greens are very good at mobilizing. When their actions, the green locals are usually called because we can bring some people and we show up. We're great activists. But now we gotta become organizers. And I'm suggesting that this deep canvassing, it's gotta be year round. You gotta be constantly going out there and talking to people and being active in the community. And that's how we're gonna build a mass space over time. Um, and you need to follow up, you know, an email bulletin on a regular basis to those who do email, phone calls, 
And then, you know, the question is, well, when do you recruit them into the party? And my sort of rule of thumb is when they start talking to you, contacting you to find out what's going on, to find out what, I, what you think about an issue. Um, at that point, you know, you know that they're relating to you and it's time to ask them to become a dues paying member. And then the last thing I, I wanna suggest is that, and this gets to the decision-making thing that Andre was talking about. Consensus has its place, especially in small groups. But as we get large in numbers, you know, working class people don't have a lot of time to sit through long meetings where we're trying to come to consensus. And a lot of times there's pressure to stand aside and really not express your differences over the question that's before us. And a lot of people would rather vote and lose than not be able to express their opinion on that question. They, they sort of feel like, well, they're obstructing. And, and also, you know, when it comes, when, when there are differences, you take a vote. And it's important that sometimes you're gonna lose. I usually lose on the Green Party State Committee in New York when we have differences, but I don't leave. And they've, they've asked me to run for a lot of statewide offices. So, um, and I, I'd urge people to take another look at Robert's rules, which I consider a revolutionary document. It's a dis 